Okay, well, it is 12.01. We're going to go ahead and get started. So great to see um, uh, a crowd here. But this is the eighth of nine uh, monthly lectures of the USHS 125th Speaker Series commemorating 125 years of the Utah State Historical Society. Um, I'm Jedediah Rogers with the Utah Historical Quarterly. Um, I want to remind everyone that next month, our, our last event will be Wednesday, August 24th at noon. A really interesting uh, conversation about the who, what, where, when of Utah history. If you're if you're interested in the gender breakdown of who's writing Utah history, or the subjects covered in Utah history, or the geographical and or temporal breakdown of Utah history, you'll you'll really enjoy this next month's conversation. So um, we'll send an announcement about that with the link. Hopefully, you can attend that as well. Um, today, we're fortunate to be joined by Rebecca Clark and Catherine Kitterman speaking about Martha, Martha Hughes Cannon and her legacy. Um, I'm going to introduce them in the order that they'll be speaking. If you all have questions uh, for our presenters, uh, please type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen there, and we'll get to those questions after the presentations. So. Rebecca Clark will be our first speaker. She's the historical director for Better Days and co-author of the book, Thinking Women, A Timeline of Suffrage in Utah. She holds a law degree from BYU Law School and a history and literature degree from Harvard University. And Catherine Kitterman will be our second speaker. She's the executive director of Better Days and the co-author of two books about Utah women's work um, for suffrage. Champions of Change, 25 Women Who Made History. And second book is Thinking Women, A Timeline of Suffrage in Utah. Dr. Kitterman holds a PhD in Utah, US history from American University. So with that, I will turn the time over to Rebecca. Great, thanks so much, Jed. Um, so at Better Days, we like to tell stories. And we especially like to tell stories about the remarkable women throughout Utah's history. So this past year, we have been focused on Martha Hughes Cannon as we are preparing for her statue to be installed at the United States Capitol in Washington, DC. And that will hopefully be happening later this year. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But Martha was a frontier medical doctor. She was a polygamous wife. She was a national suffrage advocate and the first female state senator in the nation. So by all accounts, she was exceptional, but she was also representative of the many Utah women at her time. They understood that by securing their voting equality and then using their political voice to try to improve their communities, that that was essential to help shape the new state. So today we're really building on that legacy of leadership left by Martha and by all Utah women at her time. Now, the installation of the statue will not be the first time that Martha has stood in the halls of Congress. In 1898, while she was serving as a state senator, Martha went to Washington, DC, and she testified to the House of Representatives Judiciary Committee in favor of a federal suffrage amendment. Um, Utah suffragists were really committed to getting a, a, a national amendment, a constitutional amendment for suffrage, because they had experienced firsthand uh, the fragility of just legislatively granted suffrage. So she was there advocating for this national amendment that would still take years to secure. She began her speech with this statement. The story of the struggle for women's suffrage in Utah is the story of all efforts for the advancement and betterment of humanity. Now that's a really sweeping statement, right? It's pretty bold. Uh, this is at a time when Utah was often maligned on a nationwide level. And so she's framing her arguments around the commonality that they share. And she's emphasizing her commitment and Utah's commitment to improving the community and bettering humanity. And as we look through the history of Utah, we see that that's really a hallmark of Utah women and of Martha in particular. Martha's story is a really fascinating example of the complex and paradoxical lives that Utah suffragists led. Her life depicts her effort to leave her mark on the world, even as she's struggling between her ambitious idealism and the constraints of the realities of Victorian America. 
So today, I would like to share with you a little of Martha's story, her journey that got her to the place where she was first female state senator. And then Catherine will share some of the ways that we've been really celebrating Martha's legacy of leadership throughout the whole state this year. Now, Martha stood just shy of five feet, but she had an intrepid spirit. She was dynamic, strong-willed, she was ambitious and nonconformist. Uh, she was intensely faithful and resilient and really visionary for her time. She was born in Clendedna, Wales in 1857, and her family converted to the Latter-day Saint Church and emigrated to Salt Lake City when she was just three years old. So this is really um, all she knew and all she remembered. Um, their journey here to Salt Lake was um, quite difficult. The United States was on the cusp of the Civil War at that point. It was 1860, and her baby sister died along the way, and then her father died just three days after they arrived in the Salt Lake Valley. And that had a um, big impact on her as she went throughout her life and as she was growing up and really helped inspire her desire um, to enter the medical field later on. She started by teaching public school at the age of 14, but she was so small and she had trouble controlling the male students and she really didn't enjoy it. Plus she had her sights set on larger goals. Martha was intelligent and articulate and she wanted to be a doctor. So she followed Brigham Young and Eliza R. Snow's encouragement for women to go and get medical training. She studied chemistry uh, at the University of Deseret, which is now the University of Utah. She at the time defied Victorian gender conventions. She cut her hair short to save time every day. She would wear men's boots as she was trudging along the muddy street so that she could um, get there sooner. And um, you just see this kind of practical and pragmatic side coming through very early on. She worked her way through school as a typesetter for the Deseret News and then for the Women's Exponent. And there she was mentored by Emmeline B. Wells and she really, was first introduced to this national women's rights movement and happenings of going on all over, um, not just the United States, but international women's rights uh, efforts. And, and that really uh, tied through her whole life, uh, her involvement there. After she earned her chemistry degree, many expected that she would get married and settle down. She was in a close relationship at that point, but she wanted to go on to graduate school, wanted to get that medical degree. And so she, uh, left and went to the University of Michigan. And you can see her here. She's in the top left corner uh, with other female students from her class at the University of Michigan while she was in medical school. She took extra classes in bacteriology. This was cutting edge at the time. They called it germ theory. It was new um, and, and highly important and really um, came to play when Martha was um, trying to bring her knowledge back to improve public health care in Utah. She, after she graduated, she practiced medicine in Michigan for another year um, and then decided it was time to go and get more degrees. So at a time when women rarely even went to college, Martha ultimately earned four degrees by the time she was 25, which is pretty remarkable even by today's standards. Um, she earned, in addition to her chemistry and her medical degree, she went to the University of Pennsylvania and earned a pharmaceuticals degree. She was the only woman in a class of 75. Um, and she simultaneously enrolled in Philadelphia's National School of Elocution and Oratory. She had seen, even at this point, uh, how important it was to be able to be a good public speaker and to be able to use that skill to enact change on a larger level. Um, so I love that vision that she had for her life, even at such a young age. Um, Martha was always motivated uh, by helping her community back home in Utah. So after she finished up those degrees in Philadelphia, she returned here to Utah. She brought that knowledge and those degrees and those skills back with her. And she opened a small private practice and she soon became the resident physician at the Deseret Hospital. That was a hospital that was funded and run almost entirely by Utah women. And this is the point where Martha's life really changed forever. While she was there practicing medicine, she met prominent Latter-day Saint church leader, Angus M. Cannon. He was the stake president for the Salt Lake stake that at that time incorporated, uh, included the whole Salt Lake County. Um, and so he, he was 
a very well-known person. And he was also the superintendent of Deseret Hospital. And they fell in love and they were secretly married in 1884. Now, he was 23 years older than Martha. And he also already had three wives and 17 children. So this is unusual even by Utah standards of that day um, to have such a big age gap. And um, it really seems in many ways counterintuitive that such an independent woman would willingly enter such a relationship, especially at this time when it was really the height of the anti-polygamy movement. Um, Martha was intensely spiritual and she was also deeply in love with Angus. And so um, we see their letters back and forth throughout their marriage that really indicate their sincere and mutual affection. But we also see a lot of jealousy and heartache. Um, they were star-crossed <laughs> lovers in many ways. They, they were married, but never able to live together throughout uh, more than three decades of their marriage. It was the worst possible time to enter into a polygamous marriage. Um, as I said, it's the height of the anti-polygamy movement. There are federal raids that are occurring um, frequently to arrest any men um, that are living with multiple wives. Angus was arrested and imprisoned just months after their marriage. And um, he became the focus of a case that eventually went to the United States Supreme Court. Um, Martha was pregnant at this point and she was forced to go underground. And so this really changed the course um, of her life in many ways. But Martha was not one to just sit around and wait while she was having to stay hidden um, and keep her relationship hidden. So rather than hiding out in Utah, um, after her baby Elizabeth was born, she lived in exile in England for more than a year until the warrant um, expired. And she was really resolved to retain her independence. She she gathered medical textbooks and tried to continue her education. And she wrote, I would rather be a stranger in a strange land and able to hold my head up among my fellow beings than to be a sneaking captive at home. So that gives us a little insight into Martha and how she approached um, this really difficult time in her life. The extant letters uh, that were written during her exile reveal really complex emotions of jealousy, homesickness, uh, fear and loneliness and depression, um, but also resilience and hope and faith and confidence in herself and her, her abilities and her choices. Now, when Martha returned back to Utah, she quickly became a really eloquent leader in the movement to restore voting rights to Utah women who had become disenfranchised in 1887 as part of the Edmonds-Tucker law. This was a devastating piece of legislation um, for Utah and for, the, for Utah women in particular, because they had been voting for 17 years and then had that right taken away by Congress. And so they rallied and they mobilized to be able to win that right back with statehood. Martha spoke at a large meeting of the Women's Suffrage Association of Utah that had just been uh, newly formed. And she argued, no privileged class, either of sex, wealth, or descent should be allowed to arise or exist. All persons should have the same legal right to be the equal of every other. And I, I love that. I love that even at that time, um, where there's so many divisions, and even today, that that statement is so, so bold and so true, and that she really believes that so strongly in the equality of all people. Um, in the 1893 uh, Women's Congress at the Chicago's World's Fair, uh, she spoke on behalf of women's suffrage on a national platform and um, was able to kind of take this um, larger stage and be able to share her message. And one Chicago newspaper described her at that point as one of the brightest exponents of women's cause in the United States. So her oratory degree was really proving useful at this point. Uh, Martha advocated for women's rights based on equality, not just women's goodness. That was sometimes used as the argument for women's suffrage, but she focused on the equality. And I think that that's really telling as well about her view of, of her work and of the world. She argued that one of the principal reasons why women should vote 
is that all men and women are created free and equal. Uh, after the 1895 Utah Constitutional Convention approved women's suffrage in the new constitution, it's no surprise that Martha was the first woman in Salt Lake City to go and register to vote. Um, I love that about her. I love that I can just picture her, you know, upon hearing about that victory, running and getting registered right away. And then they celebrated that victory with Susan B. Anthony and Dr. Anna Howard Shaw and other suffrage leaders just a few weeks later. You see in this photo here, Martha is at the top left. Um, and they're there at the Rocky Mountain uh, Regional Suffrage Convention for the National Suffrage Association. And um, you, you see here, these are leading um, suffragists from Utah, also from Colorado and other surrounding areas. And Martha is right there in the mix. But suffrage itself was never the destination uh, for these women. It was rather the gateway for entrance into the public sphere where women could have an even greater impact on their community. Uh, Martha is perhaps best known for how she used her political voice. So in the first Utah election that permitted women to both vote and run for office. So in 1896, she ran as one of five, or she ran for one of five state Senate positions. So it's a new state, so there are multiple uh, Senate seats open. And her candidacy was notable, not just because she was one of the few women on the ballot, but also because she ran against her own husband. Now Martha's really well known for this. This is one of um, one of our favorite things to share with people um, who haven't heard it before. And um, the newspapers also loved the drama. The Democratic-leaning Salt Lake Herald endorsed Martha rather than her Republican husband, saying that she was the better man of the two. Said to Mrs. Cannon to the state senate as a Democrat, and let Mr. Cannon, as a Republican, remain at home to manage home industry. So you see this kind of back and forth that's happening with the newspapers and um, you know, I, I would love to have been able to be there and be in on those dinner time conversations between the two during this election. Uh, but she reported that there um, were no relationship issues that resulted after accepting the nomination at the Democratic Convention. She, she wrote that she went home and congratulated Mr. Cannon on his nomination. And so, um, at least on the surface, things, um, things went along pretty well. I think that it's important to remember that they both could have won this election in theory because there were five seats available and 10 candidates. Um, she was also running against Emmeline B. Wells, who was her mentor and a fellow suffrage leader. Um, and so this, this is a really um, fascinating election overall. Um, and Martha really took it seriously. She later wrote, I worked pretty hard. I studied up on all the questions of the campaign and I made a lot of speeches. And on election day, I went to the polls and voted. And then I went and tended to my patients. So we see here this, um, her focus and also her pragmatism that she, you know, she went, she voted, and then she went right back to work as a doctor to tend for her patients. Um, I, I, um, I love imagining what it was like um, for Martha and for the state at this point to be so groundbreaking and um, wonder if they really realized how much of a difference they're making as they were shaping the state. I, I think they must have had a glimpse of that. She ended up winning the historic election. She became the first female state senator in the United States, um, made national news, and, um, and then she went to work. She was the only woman in the Senate, but she was undeterred by the uniqueness of her position. She, uh, in an interview, she said, I am the only woman in the Senate, but then every one of us are Democrats there, so I shall feel perfectly at home. And so she didn't let those gender barriers get in the way of the job she had to do. And in, in an interview with the San Francisco Examiner, she was being interviewed by lots of different national newspapers. Um, and in an interview with the San Francisco Examiner, she argued that women voting and being in office was the best thing that could be done to clean up politics around the nation. She said, we know how to keep house and we know how to keep a city. 
And she was pretty progressive for her time. She called for a wider sphere for women. And she said, you give me a woman who thinks about things, something about something besides cook stoves and wash tubs and baby flannel. And I'll show you nine times out of 10, a successful homemaker and a successful mother. Um, so, so that was really progressive for her time um, and, and, and even for today, that she, she understood from her experience that she could be you know, a really successful mother and homemaker um, and that her activities as a doctor and as a legislator just helped, um, helped make her um, able to have more of an impact in her society. Now, while Martha was in office in the Senate, she went straight to work with laser-like focus on reforming public health and education. Um, she introduced three bills within the first month. Um, she went in with a plan and she knew what she wanted to do. Um, she used her medical knowledge and her experience and she authored several successful legislative bills that really revolutionized public health and sanitation here in Utah. So she sponsored a pure food law a law that regulated working conditions for women and for girls. And she fought for uh, widespread vaccinations, smallpox vaccinations. She helped end a statewide smallpox outbreak by removing communal cups. So at that time in Salt Lake, uh, they would have water fountains with just one communal drinking cup that everyone would use along the way um, throughout the day. and. Um, because of her knowledge as a doctor and the things that she had studied about this new germ theory that I mentioned before, she understood how dangerous that was and that that was spreading smallpox and other diseases in a way that um, most people didn't understand still at that point. And so even small changes like that really made massive difference in the public health of the state. Um, she secured funding also for the education of speech and hearing impaired students. Um, and she established the first uh, state board of health. And, uh, and so she leaves this legacy that we are still uh, building on today. And I like to think that Martha would have been right in her element as we have gone through 2020 and the pandemic over the last few years that um, she was dealing with a lot of similar issues along the way. And um, I, I think she would have liked to have been involved. She was a really savvy legislator and she, um, she understood how to get things done in a way that um, I, I think implies that she had had to kind of learn how to work within the system a lot as she was in medical classes with all men and um, that she had learned how to assert herself as a female in a way that would be most effective. Um, so one of my favorite stories that I have come across and that we discovered as doing research on Martha um, and on other early legislators at this time is the collaboration that went on between Alice Merrill Horn and Martha. So Martha served a four-year term. Um, and, and within that term, there were two terms for the House of Representatives. Martha was in the Senate. And during the second two years of her term, Alice Merrill Horn was elected to the House. And they were the only two women. So they were each the only women in their respective houses. And um, they worked together to make sure that they could accomplish the bills that meant the most to them. So right from the bat, they decided they were going to focus on health, uh, health legislation, because that was really what Martha was most committed to, and art, the art bill that Alice Merrill Horn um, proposed and authored, and then also education. And so those were the three areas that they said, okay, we're not going to worry about others. We're really going to focus in and work together on these. They did some other bills as time went on, but that was their initial focus. And so they got themselves onto those committees and, um, and they drafted them and then they worked to get the support in each of the different um, houses to, and in the Senate to be able to uh, get these bills passed. And so at the point when Martha's public health bill and the art bill were about to come up for vote and they weren't sure that they had secured enough votes to pass them. These two women orchestrated scattering yellow flowers across all the desks of the other state senators and congressmen. And it was a symbol of women's suffrage. That yellow flower was the symbol of the suffrage movement. 
and it was a not so gentle reminder of the influence they wielded among female voters and a reminder that women had a political voice now um, in in the state and that um, their their opinion and their support mattered. and it was enough to sway the votes and they were successful in um, passing that legislation and um, we still have um, strong remnants of the the legislation that they passed today that we continue to build on now martha also continued her suffrage advocacy during this time so in 1898 and i mentioned this at the beginning she um, went to washington dc so first she spoke at the national suffrage convention in dc it was the 50th year anniversary of seneca falls and so they held a really large national suffrage convention that year. And Martha was one of the featured speakers. Um, and then she went on and she testified before the US House of Representatives in front of the Judiciary Committee about um, the success of Utah women's suffrage. And she argued for the passage of that federal suffrage amendment. I can imagine that she drew extra attention while she was there at both of these um, both of these speeches in DC. Um, only four states at that point had equal suffrage and very few women um, were serving in elected leadership. And so Martha stood out in that, uh, the rarity of having uh, women who were real life examples of suffrage at work. And she could speak to that and speak about the Utah experience and, and uh, really speak to some of the arguments being made by anti-suffragists about um, reasons not to pass on the suffrage and, and she could combat those and, and use the real life experience and real world examples um, to show why women's suffrage was so beneficial to society and why it improved um, communities so much. Um, this is also at a time of a resurgence of anti-polygamy sentiment. Um, so there had been a brief interlude during, earlier in that decade where um, some of the divisions really calmed down uh, post manifesto when um, there was no longer the official um, endorsement of practicing polygamy. But uh, later this year, so in 1898, when she's there at the House of Representatives, it was just later that same year that that same House of Representatives refused to seat B.H. Roberts um, when he was elected because of his polygamy. And it, kind of sparked this new um, wave of anti-polygamy sentiment um, amid concerns that polygamy was still being practiced in Utah. And so um, she really would have drawn a lot of attention and I think probably drew a big crowd along the way and had a lot of people able to listen to her uh, voice and see her representing her state so well and so eloquently. Now, Martha really was a rising star at this point as a legislator as a doctor things were going well and she was even being considered for a run for congress um, at a national level to be able to represent utah and the desert news wrote that her wit her rapid thinking and her knowledge made her capable of holding her own and of representing her sex most favorably so there was a lot of of support for martha and a lot of um, kind of momentum that she was gaining at this point and then as with all good political stories, scandal struck. Um, Martha became pregnant with her third child, Gwendolyn. And while she was still serving as, um, as a senator, this, this really captured national news. Um, it was proof of the continuation of polygamy, not just in Martha's own marriage, but in Utah. And so this is, uh, nationwide news and it really is the end of her political aspirations so martha doesn't run for the next term um, but she continues to be involved um, in in the suffrage movement and and in practicing medicine and and really goes back to um to that dedication that she had to improving public health so during her later life she splits her later years between California and Utah. She has children and grandchildren living in both. And so after her husband passes away, she goes and she's been in California mostly, but she kind of goes back and forth a little bit. She becomes vice president of the National Congress of Tuberculosis. 
Um, and she works in the orthopedic department of the Graves Clinic in Los Angeles during her final years. So she continues uh, practicing as a doctor um, up through the end of her life um, almost. And she, she died in 1932 at the age of 75. So she lived a long, full life. And throughout all of it, she struck this difficult balance between demands of motherhood, devotion to her faith, um, passion for public service and public health. And she battled with heartbreak and with depression and other me mental health issues. She battled with disappointment and loneliness um, and frustration. Uh, but she also celebrated great successes during her life because of her public work. And she pushed on and she tried to leave her mark on the world. And I just wanna end uh, my piece with this before I turn the time over to Catherine, I want to end with these words from Martha. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from her that she wrote to one of her friends from medical school. Um, they continued to uh, correspond with each other throughout their life. And at one point she wrote, let us not waste our talents in the cauldron of modern nothingness, but strive to be women of intellect and endeavor to do some little good while we live in this protracted gleam called life. I think that this really sums up Martha, sums up Martha's legacy, her vision, and her philosophy and example that continue to inspire us today. So now I'm going to turn the time over to Martha so she can talk through some of our efforts, the things we've been doing here at Better Days. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, um, as you can see, Martha's life was remarkable. Um, as Rebecca said, uh, her story is really remarkable in many ways, especially for a person born when she was and where she was to um, have the public positions that she did, to have the influence that she had, um, to have this plan for her life that she was really able to accomplish in so many ways, uh, despite real difficulties and circumstances that she chose for herself, but that made things um, different um, than, than for other folks in the same in the same time. Uh, but while Martha's life is re remarkable and extraordinary, we also really believe that she's very representative of many women living in Utah at the time. Um, in terms of her advocacy for women, in terms of her public service, um, we really have a rich legacy of women's leadership in this state. And there were many, many women who were working right at this time of statehood, in those early years of statehood, 125 years ago, about the same time, right, that the um, historical society is founded. But there were many other women who were Martha's contemporaries who were doing the same work that she was in their own ways. Um, and so we're, I'm going to focus just on a couple of Martha's contemporaries now who also worked to advance women's rights, just to give you a sense of that rich legacy and community that Martha was a part of. Um, Rebecca mentioned that when Martha ran for office in 1896, that was the first year that women could hold political office in Utah. And Martha was one of 14 women who won office that day. Uh, there were two others elected to the state legislature um, in the House of Representatives, and then 11 women who were elected to county office. So you see this legacy of suffrage and grassroots political organizing, um, the work that women had done from 1870 onward, first to try to defend their right to vote up until 1887, and then to try to regain the vote from 1887 until statehood. And you see that that really developed a lot of women's um, abilities and capacities to lead, to speak publicly, to organize, and to make things happen. Um, so I'm just going to introduce you to a few other uh, characters, other women that you should know of who are around um, Martha's time, who are her contemporaries, and then we'll talk a little bit about our work to uh, commemorate these women and, and honor their leadership. One woman who lived and worked in Salt Lake City at the same time as Martha was Elizabeth Taylor, who often went by Lizzie. And she was well known in the community because she edited the Utah Plain Dealer newspaper, um, which was one of several newspapers um, printed for Salt Lake City's Black community. Um, it also had a white readership as well. And um, Lizzie and her husband, William, really encouraged voter registration and political engagement. So we see in 1895, 1896, those early years as Martha is running and registering to vote as soon as the Constitution is approved with, with Utah women's suffrage re restored, you see Elizabeth showing up at meetings of what at the time was called the Colored Women's Republican Club. And she's urging people to register and vote, urging them not to listen to any registrars who say that Black women aren't allowed to vote because that's not the case. And you can see her 
um, you see reports of her and uh, even reimbursements from the Republican Party for her canvassing, for renting out halls for meetings. Um, she's going door to door to try to elect her preferred candidates. She's showing up at the polls on election day to watch and make sure that those in her Black community are able to cast their votes as they are legally um, allowed to do. And you can see that real strong urge that she has again, this ambition to make sure that her voice and her community's voice would be heard. Um, Elizabeth also moved on to other work in a larger scale when she founded an organization for women of color in the Western states. She brought them together in Salt Lake City for their opening convention. In the early 1900s, she has women from states across the West coming here who are being addressed by Salt Lake City's mayor and the Utah governor and other folks that she has brought in um, to give credence to this organization and to help women work together. Um, she also worked in Salt Lake City um, along with um, a reverend at the AME Church and other leaders to advocate for laws that would end segregation in businesses in Salt Lake City. Um, so Elizabeth Taylor, again, like Martha, someone who was ambitious and driven, who had a plan and who wanted to make change happen, and who used those avenues that were in some ways very uniquely available to Utah women um, to vote, to run for office, this, this high level of political in involvement and engagement. Another person who exemplifies Martha's spirit in, in rural Utah is Lucy Hepler. Uh, she lived in Sevier County um, for most of her life after she and her husband emigrated from Canada and came to Utah. Um, and as the vice president of the Sevier County Women's Suffrage Association, she helped create smaller organizations throughout rural Utah. Um, she was serving as president of the Suffrage Association in her own town of Glenwood for a long time, for five years. She had her 13th baby while she was in office here as the leader of that organization. And she raised 18 children. Um, sorry, she had her 11th baby. She raised 18 children total, seven of whom were adopted. Um, so she was really busy. And again, like Martha, um, someone who believed that you could think about um, baby flannels and wash tubs as well as public service and government. Uh, Lucy taught civics classes in her local community. And later on in her later years, she was made the honorary chairwoman of the National Women's Party chapter in Sevier County. So again, someone who believed in the power of women working together, someone who wanted to use her voice and her talents to make the world a better place. Emmeline Wells is a, is a name that's maybe more familiar to many of you who are listening here. She's probably Utah's most prominent suffragist and in many ways she had mentored Martha as she was the editor of The Woman's Exponent while Martha was a typesetter um, when she was working her way through school. Emmeline served as a Relief Society general president later in her life, um, but even before then, she had a national and international sphere of influence. She was a frequent speaker at these large suffrage conventions, often, again, as Martha did, representing Utah women and, and being seated on the stand as a real live voting woman, you know, somebody who, was, um, who people were excited to hear from and also interested um, because of that issue of polygamy. Um, but Emmeline really led the movement to restore women's voting rights upon statehood. So she was the president of the Utah Women Suffrage Association at the time of the Constitutional Convention. And she made sure that women packed the halls, that they showed up for hearings, that they showed up to watch the debates, and that they made their voices heard then in petitions um, when there were debates about whether or not to include suffrage in the state constitution. So again, like Martha, someone who took advantage of the opportunities that she had in Utah, someone who believed that women could work together to make change happen in their communities, and someone who also believed uh, that men and women should be working together for the good of their communities and promoting that as really the Utah way. Hannah Kaeba is the last person I want to introduce you to. She was another woman living in the Utah area um, at the same time as Martha, although she lived out in Yosepa in Tooele County. Um, she immigrated to Utah just before the turn of the century in 1898, which was the same year the, U the U.S. annexed Hawaii. Um, and as a Latter-day Saint convert living in um, Yosepa, she was a leader in the Sunday School and in other organizations there locally. Um, this was basically a settlement of Hawaiian Latter-day Saints who had emigrated to Utah to be close to the LDS Temple. Um, but Hannah was invited to travel to Washington, D.C. in 1899. Uh, she came with a delegation of Utah women and they spoke at the National Council of Women. And while she was there, Hannah presented Susan B. Anthony and other women's leaders with flower lays and she urged the convention to support restoring voting rights to Hawaiians who had been disenfranchised and taken out of their own government structure when the US had annexed the colony. Um, really, really important voice for, for equality here. 
um, she had been, she and her mother had been close to the Hawaiian queen who was deposed at that time. And she worked with this network of Hawaiian women who were living in exile in the United States um, to raise attention to that issue, to remind women's advocates that the rights of women of color should be included in their advocacy. So Hannah's voice was very, very needed as well. Those are four women out of thousands who lived and worked at the same time as Martha, who, um, again, used their voices and their votes and their time and their energy to make a difference in the causes and the, the issues that they cared about. They saw problems in their communities, but they worked together to solve them. And that's really important as part of Martha's legacy. Uh, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about the ways that Better Days as our nonprofit for women's history, as well as other organizations are joining together to honor that legacy of leadership. Um, as you may have heard, Canon statue is going to Washington, DC. We uh, believe she'll be going later this year, although the date has not yet been set for that. Uh, but she's going to be installed in National Statuary Hall in the US Capitol. This is a collection of 100 statues. Each state gets to send two representatives. Um, from their state. And in 2018, the Utah legislature passed a bill that we supported to place a statue of Martha Hughes Cannon there. Um, she will be replacing Philo Farnsworth, the inventor of the TV, and there were a lot of feelings about that. Um, but Philo has been in the Capitol since 1987, and he'll be coming home and, and at UVU after Martha takes his place there. Martha, when she goes in, will be only the 11th woman out of that 100 statue collection. So it's really important that she's increasing representation in that way. Um, and the statue, which you see a photo of here by Ben Hammond, it's currently in the Utah State Capitol. Um, it was completed in 2020. She was supposed to be installed in August 2020 for the anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Um, but it, she is standing outside the Supreme Court chambers in the rotunda of the Capitol. So if you go to the State Capitol from now until she leaves, um, you can see, see her there. Um, we also have try to make it possible for more Utahns to learn about Martha's story while she's waiting and before she goes to DC. We think it's important for Utahns to know not only Martha's story, but the story of these other women who really embody that legacy of leadership that we share here in Utah that we benefit from. And so here are some of the ways that we are working on um, to share that story. We've created a traveling exhibit uh, supported by state history to send um, to send across the state. And it's got this model statue of Martha's statue. So this is one created by that sculptor, Ben Hammond. It's about two feet tall and <laughs> maybe 80 pounds. It's solid bronze. Um, but she is going around the state. She's currently at the Salt Lake City and County building. Um, that's where Martha served in the legislature and she's outside of the Cannon Room, which is named for Martha. So I think that's great. It's fitting. Um, so you can see her there until Friday morning when she's going to move to the Riverton City Hall. Um, and then she'll be going in to lots of other locations in the next couple of weeks and months, um, she'll be at the Deseret Hospital at the This Is The Place Monument starting August 26th. And we'll share a link later on where you can get the full schedule and see where else she's going. Uh, but she's been everywhere from North Logan to Panguitch to Blanding and beyond. And we'd really love to bring Martha to you um, and send a speaker to your community. So if you're interested in hosting Martha, whether at a local library or museum or city building, um, you can reach out. There's a pop-up at utahwomenshistory.org. If you go to that website, um, you can sign up for a toolkit or to request to host the visit. Um, we also have toolkits um, that are available for free as well. So there's uh, printable resources that we have on Martha and these other women who are working at the same time as her. Also illustrations by Brooke Smart, as you've seen some of those throughout our presentation where she featured Utah Women's Advocates. And then links to things like podcasts. Um, Rebecca's done some great ones interviews, um, videos, news stories, um, even a short opera by Utah Opera called The Better Man uh, that premiered in 2020. So there's a lot of material there. If you're just interested in learning more about Martha or if you have students or lifelong learners in your life that you'd like to share that info with, you can request that and we'll just send it to you as a free download. Lastly, I'd like to point out another memorial that went up in 2020. Some of you may have seen it, some of you may have not, but I just wanna make sure that you're aware of this. Um, a Path Forward is a monument to Utah women's work for voting rights. And so it really, um, it includes Martha Hughes Cannon's words in that frame there. Um, and it was a beautiful testament, it is a beautiful testament to Utah women's work from 1870 onward to expand voting rights and break down barriers that prevented different groups of people from full participation in politics. Um, 
Kelsey Harrison and Jason Manley were the two artists who were selected to create this memorial and they turned this one on its side rather than some tall vertical monument. They wanted to make this one more interactive and representative of the many, many people who are involved in this work. And I think it's it's a beautiful experience. You can you can go there, you can walk through these different door frames that represent different pieces of legislation um, that expanded the right to vote to different groups of people. Um, so when you do that, you'll learn that um, the native, excuse me, the Indian, excuse me, the American Indian Citizenship Act, which passed in 1924, um, ironically granted US citizenship to Native Americans in 1924, but that states like Utah prevented residents of reservations from voting until 1957. But there were Utah women who worked on that. There were Utah women who worked to expand um, the opportunities to apply for citizenship, to make sure that immigrants from Asian countries and other places could apply for U.S. citizenship and therefore gain voting rights. And there were Utah women and men who worked for the Voting Rights Act and other pieces of legislation that struck down race-based discrimination in voting laws. So that history is represented here in a beautiful way. Um, the words that frame the door frame that represents the 19th Amendment from 1920, they include this quote from Martha that Rebecca has already shared. But again, I think it bears repeating. She said that all persons should have the legal right to be the equal of every other. Um, you can see here a couple of vignettes, but I hope you'll take a chance to go visit that. It's outside of Council Hall, which is where the first vote was cast in 1870 by Seraph Young. Um, and it's really a good testament to Martha's legacy and to the work that continues um, to make sure that we all have a say in our communities. Lastly, I'd like to just share a few other ways and resources that we have for you to learn more about Martha's story. Um, this book, Thinking Women, that we co-authored um, includes a timeline, a photo visual timeline of suffrage in Utah and women's involvement in, in the national movement for women's rights. Um, it's a beautiful, I think it's a beautiful book, um, but you can see, again, where Martha is representative as well as where she's remarkable as she's part of this long tradition of women's organizing here in Utah and across the nation. Um, and then finally, I'd like to end on this, this question from Maytin Bimbu Perry. She's a Shoshone matriarch and tribal historian, and she asked this question of kids, what is your story going to be? Um, we follow in her footsteps of recognizing the importance of educating Utah's future leaders. So we have free educational curriculum with lesson plans, activities, um, other things you can download, as well as trading cards with Brooks illustrations here of Utah Women's Advocates. Um, including Martha and the other women that we've talked about today. We think it's very, very important um, for all of us as Utahns, um, men, women, girls, boys, we need to see women as leaders. We need to recognize the people who have paved the way for us and who had that vision and ambition that makes our state a better place every day. Um, so those resources are a few of the ways that you can, you can learn about the, these women and, and recognize their leadership and their influence on our state today. Uh, lastly, before we open it up for questions, I'll just uh, put in a plug here that if you want to learn more, you can always visit utahwomenshistory.org. Um, you can follow us at Better Days 2020 on social media. If you want updates about when the statue is finally going to DC, there will be a send off here in, in Salt Lake before then. Um, you can sign up to follow us there or, or get on our newsletter list and, and listen to um, and pay attention for, for that announcement. And um, we'll share some links in the chat um, later, but for now, I think I'll pause there as we take questions. Okay, that's uh, that's terrific. Thank you so much, Catherine and Rebecca. Um, so yes, we do have a few questions. Um, please keep them coming. Um, I guess I guess we'll just go down this list. Do we have any audio recordings of Martha's speeches? It's an interesting question. I wish we haven't come across any, but if anybody does, please send them our way. <laughs> I would say we also have very few records of her actual speeches rather than just summaries of what she said. So there are a few like that testimony to Congress um, because it's in the congressional record, which is fantastic. And we have a lot of newspaper records of Martha giving speeches and maybe some pithy quotes. Um, but again, she burned many of her papers before her death, as you may have seen if you have watched the PBS Utah documentary. So it's unfortunate for us. Can you share a little bit with the crowd why, why she burned and got rid of those papers? 
I mean, it's your guess is as good as mine. I suspect, although I don't know, this is my opinion. I, you know, I talked about how she she struggled. She had this very complex life, right? And so I wonder if um, her journals were a way of her processing information that they were deeply personal and probably um, not always uh, <laughs> not always reflected well on the people that she was interacting with and things. And I think that she maybe didn't want that record to be left. That she knew that she um, was a public figure, and 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 I that was that was a practice that. Um, I, I think several people at the time did too, you know, if, if it was, if those journals were used in personal ways, right? Um, I, I think that she just didn't want to leave those records, that she wanted the other records uh, that were more public to be what was left as her legacy. That's my guess. We, uh, we also had a question about uh, the best the literature of books, articles that have been written about Martha Hughes Cannon and Rebecca. I know you you have an essay um, that that we provided a link to um, there in the Q and A, as well as of course the UHQ Utah Historical Quarterly has published a lot of a lot of material that somewhat touches on Martha Hughes or and her contemporaries. Are there any projects in the works, um, any books or any others that you know of who are working on? her life and her legacy? Yes, uh, one thing, so there's a lot of uh, material that Better Days has put together. And as you mentioned, Jed, articles in Utah Historical Quarterly, um, the What's Her Name podcast, I would say is the best um, podcast about Martha that I've, that I've seen. Um, it, it has Rebecca as the guest, so I'll, I'll, I'll share that here. But um, <laughs> if you go to whatshername.com and search for Martha Hughes Cannon, um, that, that episode is fantastic. Um, there is also a book coming out early next year from um, the press, I'm forgetting the name, Signature Books um, by Constance Lieber, who has been working on Martha Hughes Cannon for a long time. So I'm very excited to see that come out. There are some other books that have come out in the past that I'm not sure um, are as accurate a reading of the record. Um, Marianne Monson's book, uh, it's a historical fiction novel, Her Quiet Revolution. Um, she did do a lot of research. We connected Marianne, the author, with with some sources on that, but of course it's it's a you know an imagining of her life. But I think it's an interesting read and it's and it's fun to explore. That one ends with her election to the state legislature. So um but that's that's an interesting piece as well. Rebecca, have I missed anything? No, I I'm also really looking forward to Constance's book. I think that that will be uh, well done and and um yeah there because there weren't as many personal records left, you know, there, I, I think it was Constance actually that did, um, has published an edited version of the letters um, between Angus and, and Martha. So letters from exile is really interesting. Um, so you can see those letters between them. And those are really um, such a great way to be able to get insights into Martha's um, personal feelings that we don't get from her, you know, public speeches and things like that. I, I see that there is a question uh, from Christine about if she wrote about mental illness. I mean, she didn't specifically write about that, but these letters, um, the, the extant letters that we have, she talks at times that, um, of feeling very depressed, and and she says even close to madness at one point. Um, I think she was she was alone. She was in exile, you know, in, a, across the ocean and um, struggling. Uh, right before she left, she, here she is leaving. And I, I meant to mention this earlier. Part of why she went into exile was to protect Angus um, because he was part of this trial that was going on, and her presence and her pregnancy could be used against him. But also as a doctor. Um, she had obstetrics patients, babies that she had delivered. And so she was being called as a witness um, for these trials. And she felt so strongly that she couldn't, um, couldn't be the one that would take those children's parents away, right? And, and uh, divide those families up. And so she left to protect her patients and to protect her husband. Um, but it was hard and, and it was a struggle for her. And so she certainly struggled with mental illness throughout her life and with depression. Um, 
but we just get glimpses of it um, in these kind of passionate letters um, where she talks about it and then it comes back and she apologizes and, and things you, you get you get different angles of the personalities through those letters mm -hmm. um, yeah I see also oh sorry go on well I uh, just I guess it's not too much related but we did have a question about our quiet Re revolution you and you mentioned that that it's based on some sources I'm wondering to your point, Rebecca, about different perspectives, sort of knowing, you know, we don't have a whole lot of a written record. Do we have any other creative works, like any other novels or plays or poems or something that speak to her mindset? Well, I love that the opera that Catherine mentioned, um, the Better Man opera. Um, we, that we kind of debuted um, on February 14th on the anniversary of the first woman's vote here um, back in 2020. And um, it, it's a really cool uh, rendition of the interplay between Angus and Martha, you know, a creative rendering of it, right? Um, of how difficult that could have been within their marriage of going through that election and, um, and the strong feelings and why she would have run against him and he was a pretty big deal. He was really well known, but she was really prominent as well. And um, I, I love that because it goes in and explores that piece of the story more because we don't, we don't have a lot of information other than her just assuring the media, nope, it hasn't disrupted family life at all. It, it explores maybe under the surface what might've been going on. So I, I like that one. Um, I see a question about other women in the third state legislature picture. Mm -hmm. So that's the picture that I showed earlier that had, it, it's the official picture that has all of the legislatures for the House and Senate. Um, and that's the third legislature. So that's the one that Alice Merrill Horn uh, was serving in and during Martha's second two years of her term. And so um, Alice is the woman at the top center in the House and then Martha and then um, I'm trying to remember where in the picture there's a third woman there who is one of the clerks and she's along the bottom kind of and, and I think it's the bottom left so she was one of the clerks and also when you um the the image on the steps there the city and county building where it's Martha and the state uh, the state senate um she's the only female senator but there are a couple other women in the picture as well and they were um also clerks there were kind of secretaries that were working in the senate at the time that were included in that picture it did it horn and cannon inspire um anybody of an influx of sort of women running for public office i mean what who do we have in public office between say 1900 and 1920. well i'm glad you asked that question jed because we have a list actually on our website and i'll put that link in the chat um yeah. We have about 16, I'm getting the number maybe wrong, 16 or so women in the state legislature by 1920 who had served total, um, and more than 200 women who had served in county office. So that's really where you see women gaining elected office. Um, after that initial um, year, so in 1896, 14 women are elected statewide to different offices, um, and then a few women, like you have Alice Merrill Horn serving in 1898. Then there's a little bit of a dearth. There are a couple of years where no one was serving in the legislature, no women, excuse me, in the legislature in the early 1900s. Uh, but then that picks up, especially um, with the rise of different progressive politics in Utah. You see lots of women serving from both political parties in the 20s and 30s, um, especially. So I believe, I mean, we saw in political campaigns just recently, right, that Martha's legacy inspires. Um, but I do think she'd be very surprised at the low number of women we have in our state legislature and in our federal delegation. Um, I'm not sure that those women, you know, back 125 years ago would have thought it would have taken so long. Mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth Waite, uh, a wonderful presentation, uh, excited that it's being recorded. Love the quotes from Martha and other women leaders. Those were really powerful, by the way. Uh, and I was also fascinated by this initial language in the 1896 Senate bill on nuisances. Um, can you tell folks how they can access that full bill so they can see the the full language? Is that that's just from the state archives? I would imagine. Yeah, that's from I we got that from the state archives. Um and we can I mean I have 
I have the image. And we'll see if I can share that on here. Um, but, but yeah, I got that from the state archives. If you use that bill, the bill number at the top of there, it makes it pretty easy to track down. Um, and I think that that one is actually, if you go to the Better Days website, the Utah Women's History .org, we have, um, as part of our educational offerings for the curriculum, we have primary source sets um, that teachers and others can use on different topics. And we have a whole section on Martha Hughes Cannon that has some primary sources. And I believe that that bill is included in our primary source set. So at least that first page, but um, to get the full bill, um, it's really interesting and also really interesting. The state archives um, at our last event that we were holding with them, they brought the original of the bill where she's improving uh, working conditions for women and girls to, to make sure that they have a place to sit if they're working for hours and hours on end and things like that. And so, um, yeah, the, the archives is a really wonderful source um, for that kind of legislation. Those are publicly available. Brad Westwood is asking about the, the manuscripts or artifacts, as well as the statue that's um, part of the traveling exhibit. Can you speak to any of those items? Oh, yeah. That, yeah. That's a great question. Catherine, do you want to take that or do you want me to talk about these? Yeah, I'll take that. Again, since this is something that needs to travel and be folded up into a trunk, we don't have any original um, <laughs> records from the state archive or state history. Although, again, we link to those on our website for folks who want to learn more. Um, but the includes the traveling exhibit, excuse me, includes the statue of Martha, several pull-up banners. So one of them has a, a large timeline of Martha's life, again, with photos for each point um, about her education. Um, really, the detail that Rebecca went into today, right, can't fit on a poster, but there's that, um, as well as then um, some narrative about Martha's influence on Utah women and the rest of the nation. So again, including several of those quotes that, Mar that um, excuse me, Rebecca shared today. Um, we also have a timeline and some context on Utah's suffrage story and where Martha fits in that. So how women gained the right to vote in 1870, why it was taken away in 1887, how they worked to regain it in 1895 and six, and then their work for a federal suffrage amendment. So those pieces are there, as well as uh, posters and panels about these other four women who I talked about as Martha's contemporaries. So trying to kind of populate Martha's world, if you will, thinking about um, you know, the, the cohort of women that she was a part of in those early years of statehood. Well, uh, with that, I just want to echo the comments that we've received here. Um, Christine Maybe says, thank you all for your research and outreach to educate us. Martha would have seen you both as her peers if you were here. Um, so thank you all for attending and asking the questions. Thank you, especially Rebecca and Catherine for the work that you've done, for your presentations. Um, Better Days does, um, should receive a lot of acknowledgement for our increasing and enlarging, enlarging in our historical understanding. So thank you. Um, thank you for all the work that you've done. And um, we will have this uh, then posted. And so it's being recorded and it'll be made available on a YouTube channel along with our other um, speaker series events that we've that we've been holding. So with that, just want to thank you all and um, have a good rest of the day. Great. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, ladies.